Don't tell me that the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Welcome to Shining Moon, a speculative fiction podcast, episode two. I'm your host, Deborah L. Davitt. Today, we'll continue our series by asking a question not about genre or craft, but about how to keep reading when you're a working writer. We'll discuss the impact working as a writer has on our reading time, choices, and pleasure. And we'll discuss several stories that we all read together. My guests today are Chloe Smith and Brian Hookenbrook. Let's get started with some introductions. Brian Hookenbrook is a speculative fiction author and poet living in upstate New York with his wife and their daughter. He enjoys fishing, but only in video games, scotch, but only in real life, and he spends his days explaining quantum cryptography to other nerds. His fiction has appeared in Analog, Escape Pod, and ZNB Presents. His poetry has appeared in Dreams and Nightmares, Apparition Literary, and Abyss and Apex. No, he's not sure how to say his last name either. Hi, Brian. Welcome and join. thank you for joining us. Hi, Deborah. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure having you on. Chloe Smith is our, my next guest, and she writes fiction and fantasy stories. When not writing, she teaches English and history to 14-year-olds, which is never boring. She's also a proofreader for Fantasy Magazine and until recently for Locus. She was born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area and lived in Texas and Washington states, New York City, and rural France before coming back to California. Her short fiction has appeared in Three Lobed Burning Eye, Daily Science Fiction, Bourbon Pen, and elsewhere. And her debut novella, Virgin Land, came out from Luna Press Publishing in 2023. You can find more of her work on her website, imaginaryresearch.wordpress.com, and by following her on Twitter or Mastodon's Wandering Shop at Chloe H. Smith. Hello, Chloe. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, let's get started. In On Writing, Stephen King, and there's no lesser authority or no greater authority than Stephen King, right? Surely. Uh, if you don't have time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. Simple as that. Do you agree with this assessment or do you disagree with this assessment? Um, I would say that, yes, I do agree. But I also think that reading and writing don't have to occur at the same time. I mean, everything that it's all grist for the mill, right? And um, most writers come to writing out of a life of reading. So I feel like you can not have time to do as much reading as you want, but your writing is still drawing off of the things that you read and enjoyed and were moved by throughout your life. Mm hmm. I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, certainly he meant it in the context of the starting writer, uh, but reading is just a way to strengthen all those uh, muscles inside your mind that, uh, that help you learn how to uh, build stories and relate to other folks. And I think that uh, as long as you're reading, you're helping to strengthen those things. I know a lot of folks do like to talk up, uh, you know, studying, getting degrees, that sort of thing. And while I, I did uh, uh, go the painful route of getting a, a degree in English literature. Uh, I, I certainly didn't go for an MFA, and I don't think anybody needs a degree to read or to write. You just need to uh, start working on both. Yeah, I, like you, have a degree in English literature, and I went for my master's in literature because I was going to be, uh, uh, I thought I was going to be teaching. I thought I was going to be a professor. Let's just say that that dream died on the vine. But, uh, Yes, uh, I, I don't think anybody really needs a degree to read, and I don't think anybody needs a degree to write. I think that they just need the passion and the interest, but you also have to put in the work. Mm -hmm. It, it so, doesn't just happen. No, it really doesn't. So do you find that you still read for pleasure, or do you find that as a working writer, it's harder to find time to read for pleasure? Well, it's, it's definitely harder to find time, but yes, absolutely. Um, I 
feel like, you know, I have a day job. I, I think a lot, most, the most overwhelming of majority <laughs> of working writers have a day job. And so while writing is certainly pleasurable, it's certainly, you know, it's a passion project, it's still work. And so to have work work and then to have writing work, it's really important for me to have something where my brain can just sort of cruise after all of that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, reading is one of those places. Although I was I was taking some notes on this last night, and I think it's also a really like um, uh, the what's reading for purpose and what's reading for pleasure is a very fuzzy mm-hmm. line, right? Because yes. a lot of the things that I read and love, I I I enjoy them because I think they're really good, and then I think, oh wow, how did this author do this? How can I do this? So it ends up being, um, you know, a professional professional in quotes um activity as well um and similarly when i read for research which i do as well um that's Mm -hmm. often pleasurable and enjoyable i actually didn't major in english in college i majored in history um and so that's that connects a lot to the sort of reading that i do for research and um it's all stories Mm -hmm. it does indeed brian how about you do uh do you still read for pleasure or do you find that it's a little bit more like work? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think I have to. I think I'll, I'll get lost in my own head if I don't. And I, I think I need to remember sometimes that reading and writing, both of them, are, are things that bring me joy. And that can be kind of hard to keep sight of sometimes when you're in the thick of uh, 40 or 40,000 words into a novel edit or you're clocking in yet another rejection or some such, or even if you just happen to pick up uh, the end the story next year is in an anthology and start reading it and, you know, start making the comparing notes and, you know, doing the business reading side of, of, uh, of the writing career. It, it can be a lot. And having the ability to just read for fun is, uh, is a ref- for refreshing and vitalizing thing. Um, not, and not everything has to be about monetization and self-improvement and, uh, and SEO. Uh, well, and... <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what they tell me. But um, yeah, they uh, yeah. I think it's uh, it, it's good to go back to the well and just relax. It, it, writers often, a lot of the ones I speak to, uh, beat themselves up a little bit more often than they really need to, and forget to take breaks. And it, it's a good thing mm-hmm. to do that and just let things go. And I know that's hard uh, because I tell myself that too. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I do agree. All right. How have your reading habits changed since becoming a professional author? I personally find that I read way more nonfiction these days when reading by choice than fiction. Uh, I find that I dip into that as the well of inspiration for stories. And I don't even do it necessarily consciously. I'll read something nonfiction and then it'll spark an idea and I'm like, I'm off to the races. So do you, do you find that you're reading more nonfiction these days, more fiction these days? How has that, cha- how has becoming an author changed your reading habits? Brian, do you want to go first this time? I feel like when I go first, you get the opportunity to respond to what I've said. <laughs> um, yeah, no problem. Uh, what's um, I, uh, it's, it's changed a little bit because I focus primarily on, on speculative fiction I find that I don't read as much of that for pure pleasure anymore. I, I read an awful lot of it for other reasons, but mm-hmm. um, I will go find uh, non-speculative poetry. I will pick up historical fiction. I'll pick up nonfiction, biography, mystery, just you know, or even just a straight up uh, New York Times literary fiction, just to find something that's as far away from what I do uh, that I can go get lost in it. And not have to uh, to worry about it quite so much. And you, Chloe? Um, I think I, 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 I sorry, take a minute, gather my thoughts again. Um, 
so I used to um, proofread for Locus, like I said, and as a result, I read uh, both the author interviews every month. And what Brian said is actually what I feel like a lot of the authors who were interviewed said, which is this um, need to like read outside of what you're actually writing, outside of the um, arena in which you're pursuing your professional activity. And I actually feel like I might be strange because I don't have that instinct at all. Like I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy, and I write a lot of science fiction and fantasy. Um, and sometimes I worry that that will like color what I write too much. Like I recently read um, uh, When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Burnhill, which is amazing. I strongly recommend it. But then I was writing and I was like, oh my God, my, my prose just got very Burnhill-esque. Um, she has a very <laughs> distinctive, beautiful style, which I mean, it's not a bad thing, but it needs to sort of like iron back into my process. Um, I think the biggest change for me in terms of what I read is that once I've started, when I started trying to write short fiction, I started reading a lot of short fiction. And that's mm -hmm. not like my normal place. Like a lot of people uh, just are really drawn to short fiction, which is great because there's so many great venues and so much great short fiction being produced. But I had to be really intentional about um, making sure that I was reading um, a decent amount of short fiction and not just long form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have found that I, because of critiquing other writers drafts and things like that, that that is basically where I get most of my input from the speculative community. And that's where I get a lot of my ideas on how to form and shape speculative fiction in the short form. So I do wind up doing quite a lot of that. Uh, do you find that you are reading other people's drafts? Do you work as an editor? Do you, uh, do, where are you getting your inputs from other than from just picking up a, a magazine and reading something that's been already polished out there? Brian, I'm going to pick on you first. Okay. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I do, uh, I'm a member of uh, several different critique groups for folks in the industry, uh, both for fiction and for poetry, in fact. So uh, we do an awful lot of trading back and forth, and it's it's good to see the uh, um, the starting, <laughs> where, where fiction starts. Um, and it's uh, somewhat relieving for me to uh, see everyone struggling in the same way that I struggle with a lot of the, the writing process. It's uh, good to reaffirm that from time to time. Um, but you know, I, I do also it does try look to go so, out. It and, does look so effortless when when you uh, when you when you just read the the finished draft and you go, "My God, they're so good, and I suck so much," and that's the beginnings of imposter syndrome right there. So yes, uh, absolutely, I absolutely, it, and and I I go out and uh, experience that for myself every time I pick up a magazine. If I'm studying, you know, studying markets, trying to understand you know their vibe for example, mm -hmm. or uh, just uh, just doing general research or, you know, picking up a, a magazine or an anthology I happen to be in and reading what else was around me to see, you know, where, where I kind of landed in the middle of the field. It's uh, it, it's an interesting thing to uh, see, see the disparity between the start and the, uh, the end. But you, especially at, uh, you talk to enough writers, you can sign as, still see the kernels, I think, of where folks started. And that's uh, uh, reassuring because you know, we all start in roughly the same place, which is uh, you need to do an, a lot more polishing. Yeah. And Chloe, I know that you uh, said that you proofread for Locus and for Fantasy. The, and when you were reading through all those, did that wind up shaping ha anything for you uh, in, in terms of your own writing or in terms of wanting to just read more of it? Or was it a pleasurable activity proofreading? I don't know. Uh, so fantasy magazine, yes, absolutely. Oh my gosh. It, it forced me to read the whole, um, uh, issue every month. And I've just, I don't mean to be a booster for it, but like, I've just, early Sorg and Christy Yant have done such an amazing job. And it's so sad that they're going to wrap things up because like, they just, they created a really special, um, 
voice within the market. And I recommend everyone go back and read all the stories because they're great. Um, and I feel like I learned a lot from listening as well, uh, from reading those as well. Um, so reading Locus is different because it's a nonfiction publication. It's a trade magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just super professionally useful because I would read all the book deals and I would read all the book reviews and I would read the author interviews. So I feel like I was constantly getting all this like uh, basically doing research about like what it meant to be a working writer. Um, the actual doing of proofreading makes it kind of hard to write because I, you know, I have to sort of like mentally like take the red pen and put it down mm -hmm. when I'm like doing my own writing. Um, I also teach middle school. That's my day job. And so I yeah. spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time coaching other people's writing. And um, as yeah. you saw my, my mug, I would not have bought this for myself, but one of my colleagues who's a math teacher got this for me. It says, I'm silently correcting your grammar, which is not always true, I should say. Um, <laughs> but I definitely have that like very strong, like, um, uh, like fix it voice in my head um, and in some ways reading for pleasure I think helps me turn that off before I turn to my own writing. It kind of depends unfortunately on how well edited what you are reading for pleasure has been edited because very often my internal editor finds things that their editors did not find and I sit there and go how did this get out into the world? That's true, actually. In fact, when I first, like way back years ago, when I first started trying to write, it was inspired by um, a super guilty pleasure reading of a, um, a vampire story that was like, oh man, I just had my red pan out in my head and I was like, I could do yes. better than this. Um, but then um, I think as I've got on as a writer, like, Initially, it was like, I can do just as good, you know, I can do better than this. And to be really inspired by the things that I saw that I wanted to do differently. Um, but I think it's been more helpful for me as I grow as a writer to try to be inspired by the things that I see authors do that work for me and think about like, well, how yes. did they make that work? Yes, we were having a really good conversation about that last time on the literary versus genre uh, episode and we were talking about what makes something literary and we had at least five different definitions of it but we were very inspired we were very inspired by the stories that we read for the episode so we'll probably be turning next to what type of reading what type of reading do you do and we've talked a little bit about that so let's talk about some of the stories that we read for this episode. This is going to be a little bit shorter of an episode because we are we don't have multiple stories to of each other's to read and talk about and critique and everything like that. So instead we'll talk about three stories that we read for pleasure. And which one do you want to start with? Do we want to start with uh with with uh A Long Spoon by uh Jonathan E Howard since that was uh, the the longest of the stories. It's a novella. And it is the sixth in his uh, Johannes Cabal series. Yeah, I personally love everything that he's written. I, I I love his voice. I love his his wit. I love the the wryness of the humor, and I find that I learn from reading him. So, what did you guys think? I mean, I thought it was a really fun story, and I appreciated uh, that the fun came uh, inherently from the characters and the conflicts that they had uh, just interacting with one another. Uh, certainly, Cabal is a, a long, comes from a long line of uh, modern necromancers and sorcerers, uh, so there's a nice tradition for for him uh, to have sprung from in in that context, and uh, the fact that the uh, the demon, uh, excuse me, devil. Um, <laughs> you know, twist a few of the tropes that you might normally expect to see from this kind of adventure, I thought uh, brought a lot of, a lot of delight. I think um, it, the, the interesting part for me was, was actually the voice, I think, because I come from the school of uh, Douglas Adams reading for fun. Mm -hmm. um, it, fi you know, finding that balance between a narrative, the fun in a narrative voice and the fun of the story is an interesting one. And, uh, so, you know, some of the jokes landed for me and some of them did not. And uh, I thought the loofah was great. I'll, I'll call that out <laughs> rather particularly. But, you know, but the story excelled because, you know, there's a compelling story underneath the voice 
and the jokes. And you didn't necessarily have to have every single joke land to make it a really fun and uh, engaging read. What I find, and I'm going to just step in a little bit before Chloe has a chance to talk, is that since I've read all of the Cabal books, Cabal starts off as being this this intensely unlikable character. He hates himself, he hates the world, and he's punishing himself and the world for a loss that is that has marked him. And everything that he does is in furtherance of his plot to undo the death of his fiance. And it's always done uh, very subtly, and it, it's, it's almost never referenced that that's why he's doing this, but it's always there in the background. There's always this underlying tension. So as you see him becoming more and more human to, uh, as he's regained his soul and he's becoming more and more of a person in the later books, it's, it's marvelous to see the character growth, even though he's still an essentially an incredibly unlikable person. So it, it, it's, it's an it's amazing balance for me to see that uh, you, you can sympathize with the protagonist that you should really dislike. And he does a, the, the author does this fantastic job of maintaining that balance, of making sure that you still don't like him entirely. Now, go ahead, Chloe. I'm sorry to have burst in. No, 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 no. Um, I, I really appreciated that. And in fact, both of what you two said about character and voice I think are so key to like what makes reading fun or pleasurable um I thought a lot about like how, what makes one story because you can read something and be like this is amazing and I loved it and also it was not fun at all um but what makes something feel particularly fun to read and I think for me it's a lot about like feeling a connection to the character and I think it's interesting that of the three stories that we picked one was from an ongoing series and one was a retread of a like uh, classic story by another author and so I think there's something about like recognizability um, and when I think about like the stories that like give me the most pleasure to read it's like oh I get to spend more time with this character again like oh my goodness like you know story mm -hmm. um, books like um, Martha Wells's series, The Murder by Diaries, or like um, the Expanse series by James S. A. Corey. Like, I just really want to spend more time with those people. Um, and I think that that's something that's harder to establish in short fiction because you have so much less time to uh, connect with the kid, to build a relationship with the character. I definitely think it can be done. But like, feeling like you you know when you care about the character um, is definitely important. And I think, you know, like Brian said, it's a balance with voice. Like there can be um, the Douglas Adams stories where it's much more about the voice and you don't uh, build, like feel tied to the character. I'm more of the Terry Pratchett school of humor where I want oh, yes. to, like, to care intensely about the people. And also it's freaking hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I I am definitely in the Pratchett school. I like my Douglas Adams, but I really love Pratchett. So uh, I, 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 I sense your distinction between them is a, a matter of distance because Adams stays very much outside of the characters and he'll waft between their heads periodically. Whereas when Pratchett's in someone's head, he's in their head. He'll, there's the occasional footnote to let you know that there's authorial, you know, uh, narrative perspective, uh, but he's very much in their head when he's occupying them. He's a much tighter point of view. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think it also has to do with how much, and I mean, obviously we're projecting into the authors, but how much you feel like the... Um, the author cares about the characters and how much you trust the author to um, like yeah. shepherd them through growth. I mean, fiction, reading fiction is different from reading history because there is authorial intent. History is famously one damn thing after another. And so like if everything <laughs> falls apart and there's no good plot, you understand. But um, when you're reading like a, a complex, flawed character, it's much more comforting even if you never like them to feel like you're on a journey with them um and the journey and that their journey is important um and that you won't you won't suffer unduly for your liking of them i think about the mm -hmm. difference between reading say 
the flawed characters in Georgia O. Martin's books, which you care about and too bad for you, um, as opposed to the flawed characters in, say, um, C.L. Clark's The Unbroken, which I recently read and thought was really, really good. And um, I haven't read the sequel, so I can't be sure that, like, they don't, like, that their journey can <laughs> doesn't, like just make me pointlessly suffer but I'm pretty sure from reading the first book that the you know the difficulty and the un the injustices and the poor choices that they make are part of like a satisfying whole arc yeah that is one thing that I find that I dislike about when I watch tv is the poor is poor decision making and I usually wind up suffering enormously watching it and uh, th- then I bail and my husband laughs at me because I, he says, I have my hand basically positioned over the, uh, over the parachute long before he does, because I, I will watch a couple of episodes of something go, no, this is dumb. I'm, I, 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 there's too, there's too, too, too little time in life to watch something dumb and I will bail. And then like about mm, two seasons later, he'll go, yeah, this was really dumb. There was a lot of poor decision making and I'm, re- I, I, I really am not enjoying this. And I'm like, you could quit, but, but but I'm committed now. No, no, no. You're allowed to stop. If you're not enjoying something, you're allowed to stop. Yes. So, uh, Brian, uh, mm-hmm. we didn't give you a chance to talk yet. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, uh, well, I, par- partially because I kicked it off. And uh, uh, partially I was just waiting for an opening because uh, it was fascinating listening to the two of you talk about it. And uh, what I was thinking was that... Um, Going back to Chloe's comment about uh, the author shepherding the reader through the story and uh, going back to uh, With a Long Spoon, uh, the narrative voice is it's it's close, but it's not too close. And that, you know, to me, that kind of implies that, you know, we're, 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 we're looking out for you. You know, you're going to get to know these people. We're not going to put you in too much danger. You're not you're not in the thick of things. You're not in uh, George R. R. Martin territory with uh-huh. your characters. But, um, you know, some stuff will happen, but we're not, I think because uh, Johannes himself uh, apparently will keep you at arm's length, uh, the, the humor <laughs> seems to uh, to work to that effect as well, that uh, it'll, it's propulsive, it'll carry you along, but uh, it won't, it, it's not going to uh, grab you by the scruff of the neck either. And I think that, I, I found that reassuring, especially as we got into the uh, uh, the finer bowels of hell. So moving along to our second story, which is Give Us the Swords by, let me see, I had her name. There we go. Uh, Give Us the Swords by Carly St. George, which originally appeared in Kaleidotrope. And quite recently at that, if I, if I understand this correctly. This is a story that is a retelling of Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare, which is my absolute favorite of his comedies, Uh, only it's done in the style of a slasher flick. So I enjoyed the verve of the voice in the story. I didn't enjoy the story as a whole. I I had to sort of pull myself back from it and sort of observe things at a distance to see why I was reacting with dislike to the story. And I think it's just because I love the original so much that I I was not able to distance myself and get get into the whole idea of, well, now there's a serial killer working the third way through the cast. And I'm sitting there going, but hey, naughty, naughty. Uh, So what about the two of you? Since I know that uh, Chloe suggested this uh, as one of our uh, topics for discussion, I know that there must be something about this that you really enjoyed. So why don't you talk about that and then we'll turn it over to Brian. Well, Deborah, first of all, thank you for holding space for a story that like tears apart something that you really love. I know that it can be really hard to approach um, a retelling or of a parody or a different version of something that you care about. Like how many of us have been horrified by TV or movie adaptations that didn't follow our vision? So, oh, I- yeah. I appreciate no, I, I, that. It's 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 absolutely a question of taste and on on my part, and I am I am always willing to accept the fact that other people have different tastes than me. I mean, just just look at all the poems that I have written and I have sold, and I've gone, how the hell did they actually sell? Uh, somebody <laughs> liked them, so, so I'm not the best judge. I, I'm not the only judge. So 
talk to me about talk to me about what you liked about this story so that I can learn. Uh, well, I read a lot of YA because I teach middle school. And uh, so I like things that happen in that genre. And right now, like thrillers are really hot in the YA world. And so I think it kind of scratched that itch. Like, honestly, like Moto in high school is what is selling. Um, and this is Moto in college. Uh, and I also really liked it because I felt like it like, put its finger on I also really liked Much Ado um, but it put its finger on the um, the fact that at the heart of the story it is a kind of uncomfortable uh, interpretation of how like sinful it is for a pure young woman to like have a sexual encounter before her marriage um and that that can if you look at it with a feminist lens that can in some ways like spoil the pleasure of the play um and so i liked how the author was going back through it and kind of like doing a little bit of a corrective from a very like bloody and toxic angle for sure um I also just really like the voice I really like the cognitive dissonance of having um this like scream movie kind of feeling in a Shakespeare story and I think that there can be a lot of enjoyment from like a mashup okay Brian what did you think of this story uh so uh I, I think um, the first thing that that occurred to me was the uh, the the rule when it comes to cover songs, and that's uh, please please don't remind me of a song that I, that I like that's been played by somebody else, uh, and that that's that that you know then that's you know that that was always my reaction when I see something that's a riff on something else, and uh, so I always have to take a step back, take a deep breath, and and judge a piece on its own merits, and, and so first step one was okay, set aside all the Shakespeare. <laughs> which uh, took which took me a couple minutes because you know I mean that's that's a pretty big piece. It's a pretty big um, book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, so what I what I thought was that I mean I, I enjoyed it. it. It was fun. You know, it definitely pulled pulled you along. Um, I found this one uh, the the voice. I think because it was so so set. Well, the voice in this one was actually really its own character. Yes. And, you know, definitely more so than uh, than the previous story was. And so I I found myself ha having quibbles with with, with, the, with the character of the narrator as I was going along because they kept interrupting the actual story. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I definitely loved it as a, a revisitation and exploration of uh, some some of these uh, social politics. And uh, yeah, definitely thought uh, that while I saw the ending coming, that it was what very well uh, executed. I feel part in the pun. Uh -huh. uh, I, I should be a writer. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, the the voice. I think the one this for this one just threw me personally. Uh, so I mean, it was fun. It was just you know not uh, pro probably not the first thing I would have picked up myself, but uh, it was interesting to see. I think that that's right. a really good point about voice as well, because we talked a lot earlier about how voice makes things fun, but it's also super suggestive. And a voice that one person can love can just like throw someone else completely out of the story. That mm -hmm. And by suggestive, I meant subjective. So mm. I think it's also true that they're like, that voice is very, um, uh, uh, driven by culture and by the hmm. culture that the writer comes out of or that they've moved through and so for me like spending a lot of time in the like teen world um i like i found it very recognizable and less distracting than i think someone else would have and i think that's true when you talk about like cultures that grow up around different languages and different communities that's something that definitely applies to our next story which is let me see I, of course, put the everything on a different page. There we go. The Year of Rebellious Stars by Tanvir Ahmed, which first appeared in Translunar, Tra Translunar Traveler's Lounge. And this is definitely a voicey story as well, but it couldn't be, any, it couldn't be more different from uh, Give Us the Swords if it tried. It is 
a remarkable, uh, lush, lushly written uh, story uh, written in the, uh, the high Islamic style, I would call it. Uh, it's written by someone who is a specialist in Islamic uh, religion and history. So the language is absolutely authentic and beautiful and it has elaborate rhetorical flourishes that I greatly enjoyed reading. However, it was a little on the distancing side. I found. So we were, again, we, instead of being right with the characters, we were again pulled back. All three of these stories were fairly pulled back from the characters, I found. And um, the distance was a little bit, hmm. The distance definitely made me less inclined to enjoy overall. I would have liked to have been a little bit closer to the characters, but I can see why the author did what they did because that's the style that they were writing in. It's, it was mm-hmm. very historical. It, ha- it had the texture of the times in it. So uh, what did you think, Brian? I mean, uh, first off, I'll, I'll say that uh, this was actually a, a business read for for me when it first came out because uh, I, I have a story in that issue. Uh, so yeah, so uh, yeah, so I got to you know I, I read it at the time because I'm like, okay, let me let me see what else is around. I read it, thought it was fantastic, was mildly jealous, set it down, and didn't think about it for a while. So being able to come back and reread it uh, purely for pleasure was was really nice. Um, and and I thought it was as you say, remarkably well, well executed as, as a, as a story in that style. And, you know, certainly as, um, as a, uh, ethnically Western reader and writer, um, anytime that it's not, uh, <laughs> Western European, uh, fairy tale style, I, you know, I, I get to sit up and, you know, enjoy something without carrying an awful lot of uh, my own cult- cultural context with me. So it was good to immerse myself in, in a world that was a lot, more foreign to me personally than uh, than uh, some other stories that I would see. What I, what I found was that um, it took me a little while to get into it because it took a long time for the story to settle on the focal character, and mm-hmm. and I know that was completely intentional. It took a little while to get from uh, uh, you know the caliphate down to the uh, to the seers and to, uh, to what we would call the uh, the act- the beginning of the story, quote unquote. <laughs> but um, it it. it did such lush world building up front mm-hmm. that uh, I, w- I was nicely carried along. And then when the story actually got going, I had uh, all these colors in my head for how everything, you know, looked and appeared and felt and uh, uh, it all yeah, just came it together definitely, beautifully. It definitely breaks the, 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 the rules, the quote unquote mm-hmm. rule that you have 250 words to hook someone. <laughs> and it, it I was definitely sitting there going, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm hooked by the lushness of the, of the, of the prose, but where is the story going? And, but it, because the prose was so beautiful, it did carry me along until, yes, we did find our focal character, our protagonist at long last and move forward with them. So Chloe, you're the one again, who recommended this story. Why did you recommend this one? And what gives you pleasure in reading it? Uh, well, I was looking around for something to recommend, and uh, Translunar Traveler's Lounge, uh, the masthead says they do fun stories, so I thought, well, I'll look and see what they have here. And I read other stuff by uh, Tanvir Ahmed, and uh, so I read this one, and I, I thought it was beautiful, as you said. Um, I think I agree with both of you that the plot is less... Um, it's not very. It's pretty. It's a little loose, and it's definitely not what hooks me into the story. I, you know, I thought it was satisfying in the end, but it wasn't. Um, I felt a lot of distance from the characters, and really, what I remember and what I enjoy about this story is the narrative voice. And I think it's interesting um, to think about how what you said. I think Deborah about how all three stories is like some distance between the characters, um, and mm-hmm. I think that connects to that like sense of safety. Like when you read something um, and you love it, you, but you, you don't necessarily feel like it's fun. You have often that's because you're so deeply 
uh, connected with the characters and they're in the moment and it feels so intense. Um, and when the voice is what's strong, it's like someone is telling you a story. And I think what I liked about this is it felt very connected to like an oral or a folktale tradition. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that is something I grew up reading a lot of mythology and uh, folk tales, traditional stories from different cultures. And uh, I think that it made me feel kind of like a kid again, being told a story. Like that's what I liked about this story. Yeah. Well, well said. All right. So what did we learn since we're, we're, we're all working writers and we, we, we can't really di divorce from ourselves the tendency to need to learn something from each of the stories. Did we learn anything from reading any of these? Did we, did we, did we get anything out of it that we can apply to our own writing? Or was this just pleasure reading pure and simple? I, I, I turned off my brain. I, I have that unique ability <laughs> to just, you know, zone out and, uh, and read. Uh, which is perhaps rare amongst writers, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no. I, I uh, in the case of uh, in the case of the third story, certainly I'd, I'd read it previously, so I'd already picked up what what I needed to from that. And uh, for in this case, I just said, yeah, no, I'm not. You know what? I'm not going to learn today. I, I'm just going to I'm just going to enjoy today. I'm going to. Uh, uh, look at, uh, you know, impose a philosophy of composition, looking at the idea of, you know, learning to, you know, reading to learn, and reading to be, uh, have an emotion evoked. I went the latter path and I was happy for it. Well, I envy you that ability because I, I find it very difficult to turn it off. Hmm. Some of that is the analytical background of having the master's degree in, in literature and uh, uh, it's something that applies to when I watch TV too, which is, I am enormously picky and becoming a professional writer has made me even pickier in terms of what I will read for pleasure. Because like I've, like I said about TV, life is too short. If you're not enjoying it, bail. So I, even authors that I really enjoy, I've found in the last year, I've, I've picked up their books and I've started reading them and I've gone, nope, I, I usually like you and I usually have a really good time reading you, but not today. I'll, I will come back to you when I have the, the brain circuits available to not be picky. And s sometimes it, it requires brain circuits to just to turn off. It, it takes willpower to turn off the critical part of my brain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just don't have that willpower. So it's just easier to do something else. And I guess that brings us back around to asking, how do you make time? I mean, I know Chloe, uh, you were talking about how you have ways of talking to your kids that you teach about finding time to read and making time and things like that. What are your recommendations that we can take even as adults? Um, well, I, uh, I, I listen to audiobooks when I commute and when I exercise, I always have like at least two books going because I've got an audio one and a paper one. So that's, that's a big, um, and talk about voice, like off, uh, books that have like a strong, uh, narrative voice or a strong character voice are like so good on audio. I just want to shout out, um, Ben Aronovich's Rivers of London series, which is narrated by Kobna Holbrook Smith, who's amazing and it's just talk about characters I want to spend time with um so audiobooks are big I also uh my school has silent reading so I read when my kids are reading and I try to also have um in my on my phone I usually have um a, a tab open with either uh, AC Wise's uh, year, previous year roundup or Charles Peso or Maria Haskins or one of the other great short fiction um, reviewers who do like recommended reading lists. And like, then I'll pop open a story when I have a minute. Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. That's a wonderful idea. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. That brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you both for having agreed to be on the podcast. It was a pleasure speaking with both of you. Oh, next, thank you. next time, next time on uh, Shining Moon, we'll be uh, talking with Nebula Award-winning author William Ledbetter, M.V. Mercer, and A.T. Sayer on the topic of hard science fiction.
One of our topics of discussion will be Holly Schofield's Maximum Efficiency. The story was a finalist for the 2022 Analog Analytical Laboratory Award and is available to read for free online if you want to read along with us. Again, thank you for having listened to Shining Moon, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Deborah. This was a great conversation. I have lots more things I want to read now. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much.